Hello everyone and welcome to how to run the Apollo 11 mission in Kerbal Space Program 1.12 with Realism Overhaul using the FASA and Katniss combination version of Apollo Saturn V that I introduced in the previous video. So we're going to use that craft file that I gave to everyone. Hopefully you install the mods in the way that I described so that they actually work. And I'm going to give you the launch script for this is the Saturn V, so it actually makes orbit, because it, it can be a little bit dicey trying to get it to orbit. You have to be somewhat precise with it. Uh, I could do better than that launch script, uh, but for now that will suffice for launch. And in particular, it's got the timings right uh, for when the stagings happen. It'll actually manually shut down the engines, assuming that you're using the right craft file. It's a little bit of a, a dark morning, a, lot of clouds out which would not be appropriate for this launch but we are approaching the right time we are currently about two hours before launch and so we have the FASA Katniss Apollo Saturn V here and one change I'm going to make is that we'll just have the ignition of the five J2s on the S2 stage at stage sep so uh, some terminology if you're not familiar with the Saturn V and you're just getting into this uh, for the first time, maybe interested in it because of the upcoming anniversary, the 55th anniversary of Apollo 11. Uh, the engines at the bottom are the F1 engines. This stage, the first stage, is called the S1C. Uh, the second stage is called the S2 stage and it has five J2 engines. And then the third stage is the S4B stage and has one J2 engine, so the same kind of engine that we have on the S2 stage, uh, but only one of them. And so, I mean, these stages are so named because there were many variants and proposals and stuff like that to arrange things, and this is how it all sold out. And then after those three stages, uh, we have the Apollo Command and Service Module, which stays in orbit around the moon, and then the lander is tucked into this fairing here. And I'm not going to take it out because it's a pain to get in there in the first place. So this is how the stack looks. And I could go into more detail, but this is about how to run the mission. And that's just so that you understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the various things that go on. If you're new to the rocket, it might still be overwhelming. Let's face it. It is a complicated thing. Uh, so what we're looking for is that the first and second stage uh, help us get to orbit, the third stage finishes orbit and then transfers us to the moon and then the command module here captures both the command module and the lander into orbit around the moon and then after it's captured around the moon the lander separates from the command module and then lands and then the upper portion of the lander, the ascent module lifts off again from the moon to rendezvous again with the command module and then the crew transfers back over and the command module brings them back. So that is the order of operations. Let's take it to the launch pad and see how it goes. Oh, this is not the right launch pad. Hopefully you have real launch sites or something like that. But even though I tell it the right launch pad, you have to do a little dance with Kerbal constructs in order to get it to the right place. You see I said launch complex 39b but it didn't actually go there so hopefully you've watched some of my other videos on how to work with Kerbal constructs get the realistic launch sites and set up realism overhaul these are all precursor things that I've done videos on so that you can do this properly and you will need to watch those other videos in order to get this all squared away I've done those videos recently so they shouldn't be too far down the video list uh, so we need to make sure it's on 39B and sometimes you need to pretend to set it to that launch pad or any other launch pad and then set it to 39B and then it'll go to the right place. I'm using 39B because I've got the shuttle structure on 39A. So in real life they launch from launch complex 39A. So you probably don't want the shuttle structure on that if you want to do it very, very realistically. So there's 39B and unfortunately it's cloudy. I can't do anything about that. Uh, we need to go at the right time, otherwise we're not going to be able to land in the right place around the moon. We could catch around the moon and do all that, but in the end, uh, everything the lighting conditions at the Sea of Tranquility will be wrong. So we want to make sure that it has the right phase of the moon and everything, and so I can't delay it. 
All right, so here I have these structures placed by Kerbal constructs. They weren't placed in the VAB. You can use modular launch pads by Alpha Mense in order to put them on in the VAB, but sometimes they glitch out and do weird physical things on launch. And so I decided it was safest to put them on using Kerbal constructs, in which case they'll be fixed and not subject to physics. So that's the idea. Launch Complex 39A is over there. Okay, so I am loading the script into KOS, and again, this will be linked in the video description. There is a interesting caveat though. Apparently, I wrote the script before they implemented residuals, and apparently with the residual calculation in Realism Overhaul, which means that the engine is shut down before all the fuel and oxidizer in the tank is depleted, uh, because of that, even though the timings are very precise to the Apollo 11 launch, uh, we, we don't actually get to the right times on the second stage. It shuts down early because it just runs out of fuel. Well, it runs out of non-residual fuel a little bit early. So this that's just down to the residual calculation. It hurts us a little bit in terms of how much margin we have in order to transfer to the moon but it's all still doable. So I guess we'll work with that. Now the script is told to wait 10 seconds and then do the launch. It is going to the right inclination, which is 32.51 degrees. And we want to launch at 1332 on this clock on July 16th, 1969. I do have volumetric clouds as you can see, and I've got 32K textures for earth and the moon. And those are from RSS Reborn. Well, it's sunnier now. That's good. You may want to delay how long it waits for the engines to spool up. And let me just show you where to do that. And that's because sometimes it might drop down a little bit. So here it says wait 8. In mode 1, it says wait 8. Uh, just to avoid it dropping down, maybe wait 10. Also, depending on the orientation of your Saturn V, you need to change the start roll up here to be where the left wing is. So you see the left wing here is at 270, so this should be at 270. Now I'm not checking the alignment to the moon right now. And that is because we're just going to launch at the right time to the right inclination and hope for the best. We will trust that real solar system has lined everything up properly. It will keep SAS on until the tower is clear. That's just a preventative measure. That may not be necessary anymore. So again, these engines by Katniss. still drops down just a little bit, you see that? I don't know why they have the engines take that long to spool up, but... And then it turns off SAS, and then starts turning. In theory, there should be a roll program, but I don't have one built in right now. It's not super necessary for a Kerbal Space Program. So there we go, uh, this is of course RSS Canaveral HD, which you can install via CCAN. If you want to do this without KOS, uh, just note the altitudes that we are at any given angle. It could turn a little bit faster than this. Generally when I do it, I turn faster and I hit 80 degrees at about 2,000 meters, 70 degrees at about 4,000 meters, 60 degrees by 6 to 7 kilometers and 50 degrees by maybe 12 kilometers. So I go flat a lot quicker than this script is, but this is acceptable. The script is told to hold prograde when there's high dynamic pressure. But overall, the Saturn V uh, goes shallower than you might normally expect. Okay, so it shut down and actually if we go Oh, we can't actually go to that object, interestingly enough. Anyway, we should see that there's a little bit of fuel left over in there. 
So that was the separation, five J2s, and we should have the skirt sep next. And so you see, it, it should be staged separately, and that's the S2 tank that is staged. It'll actually decouple off the skirt. And then the launch escape system will separate. And again, these timings are built into the script based on what the logs of uh, Apollo 11 have. Now these are actually the FASA engines. The, these J2s are from FASA, and if you're using the craft file that I linked in the previous video, uh, you will be having these tiered here too. You can replace them with another engine if you think it'll have better results or look better like that. The stated launch azimuth for the mission, that is the heading that it goes to, is 72 degrees. So you can sort of see we're at 72 degrees. Okay, here the script is flattening out because it thinks that's a good idea. What can I say? The target orbit is roughly 180 kilometers by 180 kilometers with some deviation. That's because it's actually 100 nautical miles by 100 nautical miles. And so uh, if you take the nautical miles and convert it to kilometers, you get 180 something. Okay, it's shut off the center engine. The center J2 shuts down right there. And that was to avoid vibrational problems. You may have noticed that the center engine cut out on the first stage as well. That was to limit the thrust to weight, uh, thrust -to -weight ratio because it was getting close to four. It might get a little bit wiggly here. That just takes a little bit of number tweaking. In that case, it actually ran out of fuel in the second stage because of the residuals. Uh, you can tell by the sound that it didn't shut down normally. And so we're starting the third stage a little bit early, which is not ideal. But again, the residual calculation is apparently not super great for Saturn V. This, this stage will pitch up a little bit initially. It probably doesn't need to. And very soon after that, it flattens out, you see. Actually, it's correcting back, because it, it realized that it didn't need to, actually. During this phase, it's just trying to keep its vertical speed between two numbers. Okay, we are reaching orbit here. And it went to 202 by 175. So, not perfect, but on average, about right. <laughs> on average, about right. As far as the delta V we have remaining, uh, 3,274 meters per second, which should be enough to transfer to the moon. So we're good to go. At this point, I would double check that uh, RCS is enabled on this stage. And those are these little pods right here. And we're a little bit off from the moon. So I don't know about real solar system and the moon, but okay. Now, technically, it stays in orbit and then goes. So about 2 hours and 18 minutes or so, or something like that. We do want to get there in about 3 days. Make sure you don't get there too fast. You could hit the exact timing if the moon is in the right place. If the moon's not in the right place, uh, then... then it's harder. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Principia should have it exactly in the right place, but if you're watching this video, probably probably you're not using Principia yet. That has n-body physics and making maneuvers is a lot more complicated. So yeah, this 4 degrees, I don't know where we get the 4 degrees from. 4 days is a long time, but something is up here. Maybe, maybe try some other inclination. It's possible that it could be 33 Something like that might work better. On the occasion where I did the entire mission in real time, I had to play a few shenanigans to get it all lined up properly. But taking five days is definitely out. So, I mean, uh, I would not have done that. I must have gone to a different inclination in order to make it work out. So we launched at the right time to, as far as I know, the right inclination. But this is not a deal breaker right now. Personally, I would like to get 
there faster. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to do a mid-course correction with the service module instead of trying to take longer. So one option is to take longer and get there, or the other is to do a mid-course correction with the service module and get there a little bit faster. Now for a correct simulation, we should aim for a pre-return trajectory. So that would mean something more like this, where we pass by the moon and then the Earth periapsis is man manageable on this side. It doesn't have to be exactly in the atmosphere. It just has to be close enough so that a minor correction will pull it into the atmosphere. And so this is a free return trajectory that leaves us very loose on this side. We're all the way up at 11,000 kilometers here right now, but that was because of exactly how we launched. So I'm, I'm actually going to take this and see what happens. So we've got a decent free return. I can make it so that we're about as far away from Earth on this side as we are on around the moon on that side. And we'll see how much of a cor mid course correction we need with the service module for this. But this can definitely be done more accurately if we can just fine tune which inclination we go to initially. The inclination that we went to on launch, 32.5 degrees, is not the easiest one to go to the moon with. The easiest one to go to the moon with is 28.6. The reason they didn't go over to the moon using 28.6 is because of the radiation belts a little bit and also timing uh, for the landing, making sure that they get into the right orbit for the landing. So as far as I know, so that's what I've got for you on that. But this Kerbal Space Program, we're going to have to take a few approximations here and there and we'll see whether the service module can deal with this particular change. Okay, so we've got two minutes to the burn. Uh, we should make sure that we're pointing at the node, RCS on. Ah, um, the RCS on the lunar module sometimes likes to turn on. So uh, before launch, you might want to turn that off. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. So turn off the RCS on the lunar module. So we just settle the fuel down with H, make sure that the engine can fire, and fire the engine. The margins on the service module and the lunar module are much more lenient as far as delta V is concerned compared to the rocket itself. The rocket is much tighter. Now I don't use any automatic system to do transfer burns or anything like that. You can if you want to, like use MechGem for it. But generally speaking, I do these on my own. If I wanted to have it automated, I'd probably just use KOS. So. At some point, uh, we should turn on the fuel cells. So I'm going to do that now. Start fuel cell 1, 2, 3, and start the oxygen generator as well. There's no harm in that right now. Probably they would have done that at least to prepare for an abort situation during launch already. Okay, we would switch to kill rotation close to the end of the burn. Gonna shut down right there. The other 2 meters per second can be done with the APS, but again, we're not very accurate right now. I guess I will. But all we're doing is we're pulling away from the moon. So, you know what? Let's just leave it like that. It's up to you how well set up for the free return you want to be. Technically, this wouldn't take too much delta V to straighten out, even if we did it pretty late. The service module should be able to do that much, especially if it's not carrying the lunar module. The lunar module could also do that much. So either way, in fact, on Apollo 13, they did a similar burn around the moon, which would be even better. Doing it out here is not quite as efficient. So they did a burn at lunar periapsis in order to settle out the free return trajectory. Here we can do that probably without any problems. So what we really want to do is, well we'll wait on the correction until after we separate. Uh, so we need to separate off the command module, turn it around and dock to the lunar module, and we wait until daylight to do that. If you're doing it at the right time, you should always be transferring to the moon at night. Uh, so you're on the nighttime side of Earth when you do that, and then right here you get into the daylight side, and 
we want some part of this lit. So yeah, you, know, you should not have this butt end to the sun, otherwise that defeats the purpose. And then space bar to separate here. So here we want to make sure that the service module RCS is on. Probably do that before separating. And then we press H to move forward while doing kill rotation. We don't want to rotate away from this axis. We also want to go back here and make sure this is holding itself steady. So kill rotation here too with the RCS here. Uh, the control unit for the stage, the S4B, is uh, right here. That's the instrument unit. Right now it seems to be out of power, but there's a power in the lunar module, I think, that will suffice for now. But um, really shouldn't be out of power like that. Anyway. Here we've got the this ascent module set as target. Uh, might as well control from the docking mechanism probe. Control from here. Okay, then we take off, off, and I'm going to press D. Just use one axis to turn. It doesn't matter which axis it is. Just make sure you're not wobbling all over the place. And then if you initially turned with D, you can counter that with A. There's one time when I don't use a joystick in order to control the craft. It's only for this transposition and docking. There are many easy and hard ways to do this, but if we have MechJeb, the easy way is just to use this negative parallel. And then we use I, J, K, and L to move the prograde vector to the opposite side of the pink marker, the target marker, as our um, crosshair. So you can see it's a little bit to the right to correct the fact that we're a little bit to the left. The RCS propellant in the service module is different from the propellant that is used by the big engine. And so you have a limited amount, that's the MH and NTO, that's the RCS propellant. So keep that in mind if you're doing a lot of corrections with the RCS, as we seem to have deviated a little bit there. Uh, if you do a lot of corrections with the RCS, you might run out of that too quickly. So you see I keep the prograde marker on the opposite side there, not approaching more than 0.2 meters per second. So my limit is 0.2 meters per second. Okay. So now we need to separate from the stage, and it's not that decoupler. So be careful, it's this decoupler here. Let me just pin that. There is a procedural decoupler inside here, right there underneath the descent module in the craft file that I made anyway. Uh, so we are going to double check that we are controlling from that docking mechanism probe. Do not undock. Control from here. Aha. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, and... We are going to click decouple and then eight, uh, N to back out and try not to hurt the legs. Okay, so we have backed out using N, uh, can extend the high gain antenna. There's also a docking light, I didn't put that on though. Um, so a uh, little bit of uh, addition for you to do is to add the docking light that will come with FASA or whatever other mod you want to use. So now we can plot the correction. So mid course correction right there. But as you can see, the mid course correction like this is not too hefty at all. In fact, they probably did a correction of this magnitude as well. We do have to be concerned about the landing site, which I swear is going to be in the dark. I don't know. This is the right date and time, okay? Uh, if the moon's in the wrong place again, I swear I've had to move the moon in order to get it right before. The periapsis we're looking for here is 100 kilometers. It was 60 nautical miles. But yeah, I think we might have to move the moon again. So let me get the coordinates. So there you go, 0, 40 minutes, 27 seconds north, 23 degrees, 28 minutes, 23 seconds east. And we don't have a marker here because we only get that marker when we enter Lunar SOI. So I'll plan for another correction when we get into Lunar SOI to see uh, where, uh, to make sure that our orbit is good for landing. It looks equatorial right now, right? 
So it should be okay. I sure hope it's in daylight when we get there. Anyway, yeah, because right now it's looking like only the side not facing Earth is in daylight. And that's not what we want. Okay, so that correction in 19 hours, or actually 20 hours. You could plot the correction for the exact time they did a correction. There were many correction opportunities along the way though. They had like uh, six planned and then they didn't do all of them. They would only do like one or two of them really. I think we should start air filter as well. Our carbon dioxide's getting up there. Maybe even start air filter over here. I don't know. I don't think the air filter is actually taking away the carbon dioxide at all. Don't worry. If it's tank life support, which is what I've got in here, I don't think the carbon dioxide filling up actually kills them. If you want that kind of realism, Kerbalism exists. But be careful. Also keep in mind the supplies. Water shouldn't be a problem because uh, the fuel cell is generating more water than we need. Uh, the food is a limiting factor and oxygen is dependent on the oxygen generator. So make sure the oxygen oxygen generator is running, otherwise you won't have enough by the time you get over to the moon. This has 50 ignitions now, it used to have 40. Um, actually they've been very lenient on ignitions these days. 20 ignitions for the descent engine and then 35 for the ascent engine as I start ignition here. Uh, I used to have to deal with only having three ignitions on the decent engine and only one with the ascent engine. So, you guys are lucky. So, I'll just do the rest with RCS, but again, remember that the RCS is limited. And what I'm aiming for is the periapsis here. Okay, that's about right. And then we are going to do a maneuver as we get in, because that's the first time I can see the landing site. So I'll wait until I can see the landing site to make a correction for now. And I don't know what that correction will be at the moment. Uh, you can, along the way, uh, do a barbecue roll. So we're sort of oriented like this. And the barbecue roll is very slow. But if you want realisms, turn off the smart ASS and press E very, very briefly. And then it will roll like this. Okay, we have entered the sphere of influence of the moon in the Apollo audio. You would be able to hear them announce that. And actually, this is a good time to remind everybody that ApolloInRealTime.org exists if you want to actually watch uh, or and listen to all the audio that we have. That is a good way to do that. Okay, so that should be our correct location. And we're pretty close to getting there, but it's not quite, and <laughs> it's a little bit dark right now. So, but by the time we want to land, it might be closer. But let me do a little correction just to try to get into the line. So like that is what I'm going to do, just two meters per second here. So you can very easily fix the situation. Uh, we're getting a little bit low on the periapsis. This is fine for now. Okay, so we are going to try to capture around here. And here it's looking a little bit south. So I, I can build in some inclination change into the capture burn. They did two capture burns. And the first capture burn will to be, be to about 160 nautical miles, whatever that is in kilometers. So we'll want it a little bit loose and then we'll do a second capture burn after that. So I'll just plot it like this so that it's a looser capture burn and then we'll get tighter. We can wait a day around the moon or something like that in order to make sure that lighting conditions are a little bit better. It was the case that the lighting had the sun just above the horizon. And that was so that they would have shadows for reference and you, know, you could see rocks and stuff like that especially on landing, if they cast the big shadow. So that's intentional. It should be close to dawn there. And here we are approaching the moon. The capture burn should be on the opposite side of the moon from the Earth. So it was always the case that Earth was in suspense as to whether they captured around the moon properly. And then after the capture burn, after a little bit, uh, they regain communication with Earth and then we're able to 
figure out whether everything had gone all right. Okay, ignition. Do watch out for the periapsis sort of going down too much at this point. Since it's supposed to be uh, looser capture initially anyway, there's no harm in stopping it. I'll take that. So we're in this sort of looser orbit. Typically, personally, I would go for a 60 kilometer orbit instead of something quite this high, though. I mean, on the periapsis side. So we wait in orbit and then we do the rest of the burn. And there's just a circularize. And shut down.